Hello and welcome to this week's Blood Red podcast. I am your host, Stephen Killen. It's wet and miserable in Merseyside this week, but I am joined by Paul Gorst and Theo Squires, who have brightened up my week and hopefully we brighten up yours as well. Paul, how are you doing? All good, yeah. Very tired. It's been a long, long week. I can't believe the cup final was on Sunday, but uh, yeah, that's what happens when you cover the club who are going for four trophies, isn't it? So uh, we go again. You almost feel like you are in Klopp's books now when you've got that many... That many games, that much of a turnaround, you must be fatigued. I know, he's probably sick of the sight of me, to be honest. Um, I know I am. <laughs> yeah, very fair, very fair. But at least we haven't got Doily to uh, Doily with us today, because I'm certainly sick of the sight of him. <laughs> and Theo, how are you? How's things? I was all right until I realised I'm wearing the, the same jumper we've got, you know, for the little screen grabs where we all did our posting oh, pictures. Yeah. Some of them need to reenact it in you know, the, the blue steel. But uh, that should my, be a red still, shouldn't I it? I think mine's got a debut as well today, so... Yeah, for all, yeah I don't know, it's just that. For all yeah. you who didn't like seeing my mush, I apologise, but... <laughs> Hopefully you see it a lot more because Joe's um, Joe's called me Goldberg to Stone Cold Steve Austin, which is slightly lost on me. But I think I think you'll you'll probably know a bit more, Ghost. Yeah, that's, just take that as a compliment. Yeah, but I'm not. You not... don't get money from Joe either, as well. No, no, and there's no biscuits. Actually, yeah, we have brought biscuits in this week, so if you're watching, Joe, unlucky. Um, <laughs> but no, so we'll kick off, Ghost. The um, we'll we'll skate over the football for now. But Michael Edwards, he's been in the headlines this week. But what do we know, or, or what don't we know? Sorry. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Um, it come out, actually, what was it, within days of, of Klopp announcing his res- resignation, the FSG, as opposed to, to the club, I think that there's a little bit of a distinction there, it seems, that they've tried to get him back on board. Um, so far, no dice. It doesn't seem as though he's, he's too keen on it, but it's certainly out there now. Um, I think a few people reported, I think Ian Doyle did the story on it for us earlier this week. Um, very interesting, isn't it? You know, we we knew we know that Michael Edwards left after best part of a decade that Liverpool wasn't there around about five or six years as the first ever sporting director director wildly successful helped bring in so many players Sadio Mane Andy Robertson Mo Salah <clears throat> the list goes on and on and, and so many players who were integral towards Liverpool winning so much in, in between the years of kind of 2019 and 2022 he stepped away after the Champions League final of 2022. Um, and the start of the company with Ian Graham, Liverpool's former um, head of research. I can't think of the name off the top of my head. It's, it's just escaped me. I don't want to try and guess it because I'll inevitably get it wrong. But um, so far, it seems as though maybe a little bit of an impasse and a stalemate. And for me, I, I mean, if he had no absolutely no interest in coming back, I think you wouldn't even you, we wouldn't even know about it about it being a story. I think maybe. You know, it's it's come from certain areas and whatever else, and and there is some negotiation to be had between the club's owners and, and Michael Edwards. But for me, I don't know what to think of it. I don't know whether to think, you know, move on and and look elsewhere and try and bring in a, a sporting director with fresh ideas and, and a fresh take on things, or I, there's also a part of me that thinks, well, he was absolutely outstanding in his job when he was at the club, so you can see why they're keen to to bring him back in at a time of so much uncertainty and, and instability, maybe not on the pitch, but certainly often in terms of Jürgen leaving and, and um, the fact that there isn't a sporting director in place now. So, um, you know, both of those elements are kind of fighting between each other in, in my mind at the moment. So I'm not sure what I think of it too much, but I think ultimately you can't deny that he was fantastic in the job when he was he was doing the role and ultimately FSG seemed keen to have his guiding hand on, on the tiller once more, but um, we'll see. And we've with what's been reported to saying that it could be maybe even further than being a sporting director, can, mm. you, can you see that possibly happening where he, he does take over the sole running of the club? Yeah, I mean, I, what, I, I, what does that mean? And so, would he take over from? Well, uh, well, that's it, isn't it? So, I, th- I think it'd be like a newly created position for him if that was the case. And does that mean that th- then you do bring in a sporting director? And, and what's his remit if, if Michael Edwards is ultimately overseeing things? You know, I, I think it's been underplayed a little bit, but I think there was some internal um, kind of standoffs at times between Klopp and, and Edwards. There's no doubt that obviously they, they worked and, and dovetailed superbly at times because that's what's led to Liverpool being so successful in recent years. But maybe certain things like Jordan Henderson's contract in, in 2022, that you know, depending on who you speak to, there was some kind of confusion over that. I think Klopp stepped in at a press conference, didn't he, and said this is going to get sorted and ultimately it was. Whereas Michael Edwards was reportedly a bit more wary of handing over a brand new contract for someone who was in his 30s at the time. And ultimately, I guess you could argue that um, 
you know, who was right on that one? Was it Edwards um, or was it Klopp? Given what happened since, you can debate that one. But um, I think, we, you know, with Klopp out of the picture, that does generally open itself up to a wider remit for any sporting director coming in. You know, Klopp was very, um, or, or he is, the kind of all-powerful man at the Axis Training Centre, isn't he? And for good reason, given what he's done for the club, not just in terms of winning trophies, but in terms of completely restructuring the, the club and, and how it's viewed and, you know, the, the getting them back towards... The, the elite of, of not just English football but European football as well so you know there's a reason why he's so powerful but when he he leaves maybe there's a little power vacuum there for a sporting director um so I'm not, I'm not sure what what will happen but um it's interesting that they, they are keen on speaking to him and, and getting him back in and there, there's already been reports that he has rejected Liverpool already from the initial offer after Klopp's decision it's almost like one of them things, would you really want to go back to someone who's may- maybe not necessarily 100% committed from the offset, or is that a wrong assessment, do you think? Um, I, I wouldn't say he wasn't 100% committed, because from the sounds of it, the first approach sounded like it'd be a general sporting director, come back on what you did before, and since then, of course he's just said, it sounds like there's a bit more to it. Like if he comes in, it's a head of football operations sort of role, then you potentially have a sporting director on you, and then you go and look at a punt manager, and then you go and look at summer signings. Um, there was a suggestion when FSG were maybe looking at investment or to sell the club that there was a lot of upheaval going on behind the scenes at FSG with Mike Gordon, I think, taking a step back from the running of the club and being more based with FSG before he's come a bit more hands on. So you, you could see it as in if they get Michael Edwards in, maybe Gordon steps back again and he's the one who's running things at Liverpool. But they're obviously running out of time to get this decision right. I know the, the reports were saying that if he doesn't want it, they'll look and do something else this month now, isn't it? Because we've just changed March the 1st. But yeah, you think if you want to appoint Edwards, then you'd have to appoint a sporting director and then a manager. That, that's a lot to get sorted in a space of a few months. And while you'd have faith in the, um, the recruitment team to be eyeing up summer targets, it's easier said than done when you've got your same manager in charge and you know the sort of players he wants. Big difference when you've got a new manager coming in, different formation, different style of play. So much uncertainty here. All very well Liverpool focusing on what's happening on the pitch at the moment and thankfully none of this has really deterred them from what they're trying to do on the pitch but they've got a lot to get sorted in the next two three months and that's it it feels like the sporting director is almost the, the first piece of the puzzle but like you said time is running out the egg time is running dangerously thin now isn't it yeah it is like if they don't get this done in the next month six weeks and then you're waiting for the manager and then you're waiting for the signings you're playing catch up and you've seen before that that can be costly you want to get it done as early as possible and be as organised as possible I think that's part of the reason why these suggestions have come out now that they've gone back to Michael Edwards he he must be a little bit curious to what FSG are offering if it is this more senior role yeah. maybe there's a, a sweet a sweetener of do you want a minority stake in the company or something like that there'll be something going on in discussions for it to come out and rather than just a flat no because if someone rejects you and you don't think there's any chance you just leave it there don't you so for him to go back there's maybe something on going bubbling away underneath uh, behind the scenes but yeah, still plenty to sort out and we'll find out in the next few weeks if Michael Edwards is going to accept it and if not, who they're going to look for for sporting director. Because if you do and then he says no, and you have to go and look for someone else and that is a sporting director. Now you're still looking at the whole footballing operations side. Are you still wanting someone in charge of the whole thing? Or are you going, right, we'll just leave it as it is for now with the, the director getting a bit more power with Klopp leaving? It's all very interesting. The, the position of the sporting director is, is fascinating, isn't it? Because I think a lot of football fans, football laymen, people who just, just support the club, support Liverpool or support a club, probably don't have too much of an insight into, into how it all works and, and what goes on day to day. And um, I think that's where the mystique comes from. Certainly under Michael Edwards, when he didn't give any interviews across his, his time at Liverpool, did he, except for the open letter when he, he announced his, um, his decision to step down. Um and then Liverpool are doing all these deals, and you think, well, how are they, how are they getting X amount of money for for player Y, and and how are they managing to bring in Mo Salah when he he becomes the best player in in Europe or whatever? You know, you can debate that, but they signed him for a relatively modest sum at the time, uh, and I I think there is this kind of enigmatic thing that has developed around sporting directors, you know, despite the the little that that you know and what they do day to day. I think a lot of people equate it nowadays don't you with with transfers and and that is is true to an extent but it's a lot more than just the real life football manager player yeah it's it, but it's a lot more than michael edwards for example just saying you know i like player a we're going to go and sign him and, and Jürgen Klopp's going to work with him you know there's a, there's far more to it than that the negotiation side of things probably is 
you know the the, the remits of the sporting director, but it's not necessarily just cherry picking players for the manager. That there's a collaborative effort that goes on, and everyone has a say in that. But certainly at Liverpool with Barry Hunter and, and Dave Fallows and, and the research department, and obviously Klopp is the one with the final say. So it'll be interesting to see if that structure stays in place when a new manager comes in and or a new sporting director. Um, and it's just it's just a really interesting time, isn't it? Off the pitch, obviously on the pitch we're going to get to army in terms of Liverpool going hell for leather for absolutely everything. But off the pitch, there's a lot to be sorted, and I think results are masking it a little bit at the moment. You know, if Liverpool win top of the Premier League, Carabao Cup winners, and you know Europa League coming on the on the horizon, is it? And FA Cup quarter final to look forward to. If the, if that wasn't happening. I think there'd be a lot more concern about what needs to be done behind the scenes. And with sporting directors, it has come into the fore a lot more, hasn't it? The different sort of titles, head of football, yeah. director of football, technical director. Do you have any idea what they actually do? Because I think you've done a piece this week, didn't you, with York Smack has sort of offered a slight insight into what he was doing alongside Jürgen Klopp. Yeah, well, what I found interesting from that Schmacker interview it was, it was with, with um, Die Zeit in Germany, which uh, Neil Jones told me is uh, the Times in, in German. He, he he basically said he thought the Bosley was was overpriced. You know, sixty million euros was his buyout clause, and there was obviously some negotiations to be had there with with Leipzig before time was running out and Liverpool decided it needed to be paid and paid by June the thirtieth, I think. Uh, so if he thinks that's overpriced, did someone ultimately overrule him and say, "Look, we're going to have to get him in because he's a top top player and you know we we need midfielders." So I th- shows I, this conversation, doesn't it? Yeah, I I thought that was interesting, but you know, again, that comes back to with it being a collaborative effort, I guess, and Klopp ultimately having the final say. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of the sporting directors, I think as a as a position, it's it's filled with a bit of mystery, and and that makes it a little bit sexy, doesn't it? You know, people trying to find out the inside of it all, the 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 comings and goings and whatever else. But I think um, I think generally it's about the contacts. I think Michael Edwards' contacts across European football, you know. Agents, directors of football, sporting directors, whatever you want to call them, um, and that was what allowed Liverpool to, to steal a march so many times, and also um, what enabled them to create some some good deals. Essentially, you know, the, the unusual one with Leipzig for, for Naby Keita, for example. You know, the, how that was structured and um, Minamino's buyout clause at Salzburg that was kind of found because Michael Edwards had a great relationship with the, the Red Bull stable and it's just little things like that to go under the radar but generally you know contacts seems to be the uh, the main thing for a would-be sporting director we've seen that a lot of times haven't we like you can think of even back to Roberto Firmino the fact that they had the contacts there for that to get done so quickly flying out to South America to conclude the deal do mm. the medical uh, we've seen it with a lot of the port players who've come from Portugal or played in Portugal oh, Julian Ward, Julian yeah, Ward yeah, yeah. Diaz Jota Nunes I know Jota was from Wolves but obviously he's played in Portugal so those contacts make a massive difference yeah. and I think Jamie Carragher said he spoke to Michael Edwards and yeah. asked yeah, that yeah. question and that was the answer that came back it's all about contacts uh, we send that with Schmachter himself where I think we can all pat him on the back for saying he's got a master choke and endo coming in with Sabosli. I'm I'm probably safe to assume that that is the record signing of his career seeing yeah. as he was yeah, yeah. shopping in a much smaller market before that. So one that, he knows well though, isn't it? Yeah, it's one, a player he knows well but it's still something he wouldn't have been used to spending. Well, well all three of us are from Germany weren't they? Yeah. You know, no surprise. He, that's where his, his expertise and his contact book was. You'd argue Gravenberg was already kind of on the agenda and maybe he didn't want to pay that much for, for, for him. I was like, but ultimately it does seem to be contacts with the, the sporting directors. And I've made a joke about it being dull and miserable, but the sun's sort of shining yeah, through. Yeah. Not, but let's talk on to the bright side of things with football. Of course, you were um, you were in position. Like it was cold on Wednesday, wasn't it? Where in Liverpool? It's always cold. On, yeah. Took on Southampton. Were you there, Steve? No, no, I was watching from afar. Um, How do you know it's cold then? It's, 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 it was February, but now it's. <laughs> I'm pretty much pale anyway, so I know when it's cold, when it's cold, so never never any in between. But no, uh, Paul, so football and Liverpool played well and they, they fielded a lot of youngsters who definitely earned the stripes, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, six six academy graduates in total, if you include Gallagher, it's been a long time since he's been one of those, but yeah, brought three off the bench. Um, just a, another unbelievable night, wasn't it? You know, um, I think you're looking at it before the game and I think we spoke about it on Monday where I was a bit hesitant about how serious it was going to be treated because you're suddenly thinking, well, they're a bigger fish to fry and um, kind of weathered the storm early on, didn't he? Um, you mentioned about it being cold. I think that certainly um, it was raining down with chances for Southampton in the first half, but 
you know, brand new team dug in. Joe Gomez was a defensive mid, grew into the game, I thought. Um, you got to got to ride your luck, haven't you? Southampton had the chances, didn't stick them away, and then Liverpool strike back with with Lewis Kumas his, his um, debut goal on his on his Liverpool debut, his senior debut in men's football. Great story for him, and then the um, the feel good story of the week is Jaden Dans, isn't it? You know, coming off the bench against Luton for his senior debut, coming on the bench at Wembley and nearly scoring actually and getting a winners medal and then scoring his first two Liverpool goals. Liverpool born. Um, I thought it was great when he was getting interviews after the game, and, he, and he's talking about you know my family are in the crowd, my dad, my mum, my nan, which just seemed very scouse in the way yeah. he said it. I was like, I mean, we can always going to kick the ball in the cop as well, which <laughs> I think most of us have done in a, in a park for like many years ago. But yeah, yeah. He's living um, the dream, isn't he? Took his, his first one superbly, didn't he? A little dink over the goalkeeper kind of reminded me a little bit of Goldie Gakpo against United last season. Um, and then the second showcased what he was all about, you know, little fox in the box, reacting first. Sticking it away and um, brilliant night for so many. Hugely proud week for those at the academy. I was speaking to someone earlier this week there, and uh, they were getting a little bit emotional when they were talking about, you know, all these lads doing so well. You know, Jaden Dans, obviously Kumas, um, James McConnell, Bobby Clark, and you know, to a lesser extent, Jarrell Kwanza and, and Connor Bradley. You kind of put in that first team bracket now, don't you? And uh, and Kelleher, of course, and and maybe again Harvey Elliott too. He's still only 20, but 100 Liverpool senior appearances to his name. And this is when they're missing Trent, Jones, yeah. Bissetic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, memorable week for the academy. And to be fair, I think a lot of the senior players have got a lot to thank You know these these players for. for When they look back on their careers and they see that League Cup, middle, League Cup winners medal of 2024, a lot of it will be down to those lads. I think, Theo, when you look at the players, when you see how young they actually are, you can sort of maybe think they've been thrown in and maybe look out the, out the depth. There's still mm. going to be games where they are going to feel like that. But they have got that certain knack about them, haven't you? And with the Youth Cup, you've seen you've got like Chelsea and Man City who are like zero winners of that competition. Obviously, you've got a glittering youth system and you don't ever really see them thrive in them clubs. You've only seen with Southampton or Brighton. But with Liverpool, you've maybe gone slightly under the radar after 2019's win in the FA Youth Cup and now these players are showing all the hard work that's going on behind the scenes at Kirby. Well, that's the benefit of having a manager in place for nine years. Mm. Like Liverpool play a very specific, certain way with pressing and they've adapted it with the inverted fullback recently. And this is something that if you go to the academy, you will see the 21s doing that. You will see the 18s doing it. They are all scored in the same style of football. Of course, you know, I've spoken to the coaches there many times and Barry Lutz is always coming out saying how they're meant to be a lesser version of the first team. That is their aim. That is what they try to do. So it's as seamless for these players to get into the first team and make an impact. And they're certainly reaping the benefits from that. The fact that these players who you've just mentioned there, like Dans, Kumas, Trey and Yoni, um, even Amaro Nalo, I know he was only on the bench. These aren't proven under-21s players yet. Kumas has been with the 21s all season, but they're still under-18s in terms of age and profile. They're above their age level doing well and they're getting called up again. They're doing amazingly well, but it's because they've been coming through the ranks with Liverpool, the two strikers. The other two were elite players at that age groups, under-16 level, signed from Leicester and West Ham. And they've all just all come together and it's clicked really nicely. Uh, Vitor Matos is obviously very key to that. Pep Linders was beforehand, you know, bridging the gap between first team and academy level. And we talked about needing a new sporting director, new manager. Those are appointments they're going to have to get spot on as well to make sure it is as seamless as possible when the new ones come in because you you want this pathway to remain open. You want a new manager to come in who's still going to turn to the academy. You want your academy players to still be able to make that step up, play the same style of football, adapt to what the next style of football is going to be. Uh, it's been great so far. This has been what all the work under Klopp has been building up to. We've seen young players play for him before in cup games. And while they've had a few appearances here and there, no one has really stood out apart from Curtis Jones as they're going to be regular first team players. You've had Keller come through for a few, Elliot, yeah, great. But below that, you're thinking like Nico Williams, aren't you? Players, you know, they'll do a job for a couple of years and then you're probably going to have to say goodbye. We're not saying that about Connor Bradley or Jarrell Quanser. I don't want to get ahead of him here, but you think they can be first team players for Liverpool for years to come if it clicks for them under the new manager. And then these next crop, 17 years old, 18 years old, 16 in Trey and Yoni's case. Like, there's so much time ahead of them. And you forget how young they are. Like, you forget how young Harvey Elliott is, the fact that he's still 20. Yeah, yeah. Um you don't need to really be looking at their next stages of the career until, what, the 22, like we're seeing with Curtis Jones now. 
so much time to keep learning the trades and impress. But yeah, this has been a really promising start from him. Also as well, I wrote a little bit about this in the, in the verdict on Wednesday night. I think you're seeing the benefits of, of the Axis training centre now, Liverpool moving from the Melwood base to to the site in Kirby. It just makes things easier in terms of logistics. You know, if, if Liverpool need a couple of players for training, or Klopp rather specifically, it's easier to just ferry them across on, on the same site, you know, get a couple of under 18s and under 21s and get a closer look at them and see what they're all about rather than previously they used to have to get ferried across from Melbourne in a taxi of, you know, 10, 15 mile round journey, whatever it is. That just made things a little bit more difficult. Um, wasn't as easy to do it on a an ad hoc basis to just call someone up and, you know, let's see, let's get a look at Kate Gordon, let's see what he's There's up to. There's a lot of stories as well, isn't there, where the players sort of felt like they didn't know. They couldn't. They looked up to these players, and yeah, now yeah. they're, they're mixing the rubbing shoulders with them. So it obviously, yeah. so that barrier down. obviously, from a coaching perspective, it's easier to get to get them into training and have a look at them. But also, these young lads are getting to train with Mo Salah on a weekly basis, or you know, whoever it is. You know, say Conor Bradley, for example, when he was before he was the kind of a bit established the way he is now. You know, he's training the next to Trent closely and seeing what what he does and little things like that. It all helps massively, and um... you get that with Salah and Elliot as well. Like Elliot's always said, he'd yeah. look at Salah in the canteen and see what he's eating and stuff like this. If they've got the right attitudes, they're all going to be doing that. Yeah. It does go across the whole base. And Van Dijk, especially, he's been. I think he said when Neoni was coming through, he walked down and seen him playing for the 18s on one of the days off, didn't he? So it's just reaping the benefits, and I think, like I said, there, it's like it's gone under the radar, and Liverpool are reaping the rewards from. Hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it was obviously a. Taken with a heavy heart, the decision to leave Melwood. But you know what are we now? Three years in, is it three or four years in, um, you're starting to really see what it all means for them to be on the same, same site, same kind of one club ethos and whatever else. And uh, yeah, it's massively paying dividends. And Theo, you were the, the, you were there at Ellen Road yesterday with a few of the youngsters. That probably is the only blemish on there. Probably memorable weeks where they've not got that effort you've got to battle for now, and you've seen Dan's and Kumas were a part of that seven-one win over Arsenal. So I think that probably does show that they're not just there for to make weight and just to plug a few gaps. They are basically now going to be in and around that first team. Well, I've got a piece coming later to say about uh, this game and the youth cup exploits. When when they thrashed Arsenal seven-one, there was real talk that Liverpool were thinking they could go all the way in the tournament this year. Like Dans and Kumas by that point had established themselves in the twenty ones and they were dropping down and they wanted to drop down to play with their age group to win the tournament. But the FA Youth Cup is not the priority for Liverpool Football Club. It is to produce young players to play in the first team to make that step up. They might have had an early exit from the Youth Cup here, but it's come at the sacrifice so they could win the League Cup, so they could progress in the FA Cup. So it's a little bit bittersweet, but that's what you want at the end of the day when you're one of these players, when you're one of these coaches. Like they were out with, without four players last night because they'd been with the first team the night before. Uh, you can't really knock that can you it's not a failure that Liverpool it's that success yeah it? that, that's yeah. success the coaches will all say that themselves they have done their job they've got the players there and that's motivation to the rest of the teammates as well like Trent Cohn Docate who scored a great goal late on last night he's another who's trained with the first team he's a really exciting winger but he's not had that opportunity yet to be in a match day squad if you're seeing Kumas there Dan's there you're wanting to be the next one. And, you know, in the summer, there's a new manager coming in. There's a senior international tournament, so the first team players won't be there. This audition for them to impress the coaches during the next few weeks and months so you get that chance. And if you don't get it now, to get it in the summer. But that's how competitive the academy level is. It's always about being delighted for your friends but wanting to follow in their footsteps as well. And, of course, the club said this week... Let's, let's celebrate them now on Wednesday but then he's going to yeah, be yeah. like the next star yeah. sensation Luke Littler but he's apologised for that today he didn't want to put words in people's mouths type of thing but he, he is sort of true to an extent isn't he where you yeah. do have to sort of temper these expectations because they have still got time to grow up we've seen with Bichetich and Jones they have to spend an awful lot of time out yeah definitely I, I, I totally get where he was coming from with that because it's great you know these lads coming on and having an impact against Chelsea in the Wembley final and Liverpool in the League Cup and then firing them through in the FA Cup, it's all good, positive, feel-good storylines, aren't they? But I think I think what he was getting at with that was, you know, let don't start asking about them every week because they've still got so much learning to do, so much to grow, and it's been a, a wonderful week for everyone. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be fighting Liverpool to the Premier League title this season. So I, I could totally understand where he was coming from with that, and I don't think anyone realistically expects that to happen. But it was just a kind of glimpse into what is emerging out of the action or the. The KB Academy at the moment, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I, I could 
see what he meant by that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not it, what it means now, I guess, is it's not going to be a major surprise when you see Jaden Downs on the Liverpool bench. But ultimately, I still think there's not going to be a rel- over reliance on him to, to do the business in, in the Premier League either. So, yeah, it was just a little bit of a taste of, of what might be to come in, in, you know, months and years to come. But, um, I could, I could certainly see where he was coming from with that in terms of just temping your expectations and um, don't expect them to be um, to be stars next week. Put it this way, if everything goes to plan, unless Liverpool win the Premier League title with two to three games to go after Forest, you're probably not seeing them in too many Premier League match day squads this season. Like You're expecting, we'll get to it a bit, the injury news, but three or four of them will be back, and first team players will be back in the squad this week. So that lessens their opportunities. And then you've got a couple of more next week, week after, they're not going to get too many inj- um, chances if you stay clear of injuries. But Klopp said that, actually, no, sorry, it was Virgil van Dijk who said that in the mix zone in midweek. And then it's how you adapt to that, how you learn from that to make sure that you do then get your next opportunity or you're ready for it when it does come. This is just that first taste for them and there'll be plenty more because they're all such talented young players. And um, Paul, there's a, the question here saying if, if I'm the owners, I would sit down, sit Jürgen down and indicate he is not to leave. He can take as much as he wants. And I think he was asked that question more or less today. Like, are you going to miss these players? And yeah. not just the young ones, you're going to miss the rest of them. But it almost feels like surely not now. You can just sort of hang your hat. But he also did say the caveat that he said, I'm leaving it and in probably the best position. So, Yeah, I mean, um, the scenes the scenes on Sunday, you were looking at them thinking, do you remind me again why he's leaving? Because everything was... It was all what it was, it was all in unison, wasn't it? The fans and, and the players in the uh, in the huddle and in the, the, the penalty area, and it was just one unified force. And and he's created that, hasn't he, over the years? Um, and then he goes and labels that League Cup winners as as most famous uh, or, his, or his favourite trophy that he's won. And I think in the cold light today, he he might kind of roll back on that, but at the time, that's what he felt because of the emotion behind it and the fact that he won it with you know five or six academy kids in the team and whatever else. But yeah, I think from his perspective, his mind is certainly made up. Um, from the club's perspective and from the owner's perspective, you know, why would you not look to try and coax him into one last U turn and a little rethink? And I don't think he'll do it, but um, they probably wouldn't be human if they wouldn't have at least, you know, informally explored that. And maybe he's told them no and no means no. But yeah, it's. Um, I just got the feeling on Sunday, just like, well, why, why is he leaving? You know, everything seems to be go in the, in the exact direction he wanted to but uh, clearly his mind's made up and he's made his reasons and Liverpool will have to uh, to look elsewhere but for now he's still at the helm and uh, it could be his, his best few months yet couldn't it? There's a symmetry to it isn't there like two years ago when they were going for all those trophies that's what made him sign yeah, that new yeah, contract yeah. So he got caught up in the emotions a little bit thinking he had the energy to carry on and now it's new light on it yeah, it's time to walk away. Like, I can understand why he's wanting to go because we can say, oh, this squad is so, so good. It's so young. It's just going to get better and better. Why don't you stay in charge for a few years and do that next step for it? But if he does and they win more trophies, then the next bunch of youngsters are coming through. Then the next players are older and you need to replace them. And it's just this never-ending cycle. Like He has won everything with Liverpool. He's turned them into one of the best sides on the planet again. And he's not gone at a time where it's reached the peak and it's only way is down. He has rebuilt it. So there are all these youngsters who can, can come and support the first team. He's signed young players who can replace what we thought was the impossible job of replacing Salah, Firmino, Mane. There's still big jobs to be done for the next crop, whether it's replacing Salah, Alisson, Van Dijk, but it's a lot healthier than when he took over the club. And I think it was uh, in this press conference, wasn't it? They, they said that's what he promised when he took over, that I will leave with this club healthier than when I took over. You can't fault him for that. And one of the reasons for, like, you look at the back line just finally before we move on to tomorrow's game with Joe Gomez. You mentioned him at the start, of course. He, he's proven himself, he's weighting goals almost now, isn't he? Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And, and I must admit, I was one of the ones who thought maybe the time had passed him by in the summer. I thought last season was difficult for him alongside Joel Matip. And I was thinking maybe this is the opportunity for him to, uh, to cut loose and move on start playing every week as a centre-back like he'd like to be, maybe a little bit further down the pecking order, but um, he's been absolutely superb, whether that's been at right-back. He hasn't played too much at centre-back, but I'm sure he's um, he's done well there whenever he's been called upon. I can't think of too many off the top of my head, but he's filled in superbly at left-back when Simakas got injured at Arsenal. And then there he is now adding another string to his bow, you know, the number six against uh, Southampton. Um Brilliant. Can't speak highly enough of him really for what he's done this season, uh, particularly at, at you know, Jordan, that 
spell when Liverpool didn't have any left backs and he, he just filled in like it was nothing. And uh, we had a chance to speak to him actually at Wembley and he was thanking the fans for um, for what they were able to do for the team, drag them through with, with the LA, LA, LA in, in extra time. And um, I asked them actually, you know, with all, you know, everything that you see in today and what this manager's created, um, could you not see him maybe having a rethink? And he said, you know, it's it's great and all that, but the gaffer's made up his mind and we just want to give our all for him for the rest of the season. And, and uh, I think that's been a real driving force, actually, for the last sort of five weeks. You know, it's been noticeable how much they've dug in, responded and, and battled through adversity and um, kept everything going along. I think... The, with um, with Gomez, he's almost been one of them players like last season. A few pretty bad performances with against like Real Madrid, which you bounce off a, a bad game against them. But he's one of them players over the last nine years who has had those peaks and troughs. He's more than most had the ups and downs, are very much a roller coaster sort of time. But he's always came out, and he's especially now he's proven his worth. And I think he probably could be in contention for talk of getting a new contract in the near future, maybe. Didn't he only have a new contract last year, year before? He signed a, a long term one recently. Oh, just, I, think, I, I, think recently. I think it was it was like November twenty twenty two. No, it was, it was a while ago now. I think so it was the one after Salah, wasn't it? Mm. So he's still he's tied to the club for a while now, and um, I, I think I was the one who, who got the info for the club on this one. If it, it was the summer around then, but anyway, th- th- they were saying there is a, so much faith in him being one of the best English centre backs in like, Premier League, and there wasn't any suggestion on the club's part that they wanted him to go and they've got faith in him to keep on getting better and better and Doyley spoke to him in pre-season that year where he, he pointed out I'm still younger than Virgil van Dijk was when he joined this club and when you look at it like that it's like well why can't Joe Gomez go and carry this on for the next six years and mm-hmm. be this constant in Liverpool's defence the only thing that's against him now is Canate is a first choice centre-back and you've got Quanza coming in behind that and he's had to reinvent himself slightly but this season he's done that superbly like throughout his Liverpool career we've seen him at full back on both sides and it's always been he's not Trent like he can put in a cross he can get forward but it's not natural to he's him. improved he has defensively improved yeah, yeah. but um, he's also so good on the ball now as well and I think people were surprised when like he became that inverted fullback when Trent first got injured and he looked so calm and then we see him as a, a number six in midweek. It's like, yeah, you, you can do that job. He's a lot better than people give him credit for. And he just needs to stay clear of injuries. And he's not as though he's one of these players that gets a few knocks and he's out for a couple of months and he's back and then he gets struck down again. He's had two or three really serious injuries in his career that have kept him out for half a season, if not longer. And then when he's back, someone else has got the place on the team and he's not got the rhythm and then he's in and out the side and it's not worked for him. And I think that's understandable and it's a difficult position to come into, especially when you've not got that constant position, that constant relationships. But this year, he's just made a mockery of that completely, hasn't he? Like, he can play left-back, fine. He can play right-back, fine. CDM. Um, we've not really seen him much at centre-back, as Gorsty said, but you wouldn't have any doubts about him playing there. And it's about his abilities, the fact that, oh, Sorry, Joe, you, you're not going to play your favourite position today because we need you somewhere else. Like when we were pricking our teams, I think I had him to be sent back in midweek because you think, oh, go on, have a go at your favourite position. But Van Dijk and Canate did the half each, but he's such a, a gifted player. You're glad to see him put a season together without the injuries so far and to show what he's about because he, he was harshly written off last year. And he's bounced back in a superb style this year. And if he can keep it up, be this Mr. Versatile, be this Mr. Reliable, he's definitely going to be someone the new manager needs to rely on. And if you're just tuning in now, hello to the 113 people watching. We haven't quite got into the forest yet. We are about to now, so make sure you leave your questions in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. Oh, this is like a clock press conference, isn't it? In a massive podcast and whatever, and we don't even talk about the opposition coming up. But we are moving on to now. There was a, some positive injury news, and there's also a lot of question marks, and we'll move on to one of the conspiracies, which I'm interested to get your thoughts on in a minute, Gorsi. But some positives to run into from Klopp. Yeah, I mean, we know that there's so many who are still going to be sidelined for a few weeks, but the big kind of maybes were Darwin Nunes, Mo Salah, and Dom Zabozlai, weren't they? Two out of three, I guess. I think Klopp ruled out Salah in the open press conference, um, but suggested that Nunes and Zabozlai could feature. I think, he, did he say he, they've, they've already trained? Yeah, those two have trained. Yeah, and they'll be part of training today. That indicates that the green light will be given if they've played in two training sessions. And let's face it, Liverpool need them, don't they? Liverpool need more than, than two back. They could do with at least half a dozen. Uh, Endo is going to be... Touching go, is he? Um, today. Yeah, yeah, he's today. Yeah, he's training today. Robertson. Again, uh, today. it might might just be a case of needs must if they uh, if they got no midfielders. But yeah, I mean, they could do with Nunes back. I think um, 
it's a case of whether Elliot moves back into midfield or, or whether Elliot gets the you know the the day off after his exertions of the last week. But um, yeah, I mean losing losing Gravenberg, who hasn't exactly set the world alight, but just losing him is was a massive blow, and Endo as well. Thankfully, it looks like Endo's wasn't too serious, but the last thing Liverpool need now is, is more injuries. So to at least get a couple back. Um, maybe two or three for for tomorrow would be huge. I think Theo, you know, when when you hear that when you see Endo in his protective boots and then you hit, see him walking up the stairs, fine, and you see him he training, could be training today. It's it sort of gives him a bit more of a boost for the, the rest of the, the team, doesn't it? Where you're not there's not much of a patch job anymore. Still is in parts, but there is also a slight glimmer of light and hopefully hope at the end of the tunnel. And I think we've been saying for the last two, three weeks, haven't we? Surely this injury crisis has got to ease up a little bit because normally when Liverpool have had injuries, it's been like one in, one out. So like take Endo McAllister at the turn of the year, for example. McAllister gets injured, Endo comes in the side, does brilliantly, but then he's off to Asian Cup and it's just as McAllister's coming back. Whereas now it seems like three weeks that no one's coming back, no one's coming to rescue you, you've got to do this yourself. And now we're at least starting to see some of the cavalry come back but it's only going to be two, three players this week and Salah next week. If you're very lucky, Curtis Jones for the FA Cup game against United, and then that's your lot. Like We, we don't really know when Alisson, Jota, Thiago, etc. are going to be back. Uh, Pep Linder said it's after the March international break, but that means they don't know. Like, there's a suggestion these are quite serious injuries, so while they might not be season-ending, it's going to be a while. So this is going to be Liverpool's squad for the run-in. And it is a boost because like, when we're talking about the Brentford game where you see players stretched off in protective boots, you see that sight and you just resign to it being the worst case scenario because that seems to have been the case a lot of the time for these injuries. So for Endo to only miss one game, maybe two, that, that is a big boost because he's been huge in that midfield. Uh, I, I wouldn't risk him tomorrow. Like Even if he trains today, that's one training session and Klopp's rule tends to be two, doesn't it? So, but you'd still probably need him on the bench just because numbers dictate that you don't have anyone else, anyone else there who can make it up. But yeah, it's getting a little bit healthier now. Needs to ease up a bit more, but we're getting there. And, and Gorsi Salah's obviously not touching go. He's maybe not too far away. Klopp said it's for next week. Yeah, yeah. I, I still don't think he'll play in the, the Sparta Prague game. I think they're wrapping him in cotton wool for maybe Man City on the Sunday, but. Um... You know, I guess a lot can happen between now and then. We'll probably have a few podcasts reflecting on a few more injuries before then. But uh, yeah, like Theo says, good to have at least a couple back. But um, I just think with with so many important games coming up, they could really do with a few more. And with the next week, possibly a time frame for Salah. I love a good conspiracy, as I mentioned before. It's like Salah's a bit vague on. There've been vague comments about his injury. Is there anything to worry about there? Do you think, or is it just you only see him running for the latest? At least that vet, which we won't name for for advertising reasons. Hmm. But where um, do you feel like it is as serious as first thought? Because obviously he was rushed back. Yeah, I mean it might might be minor. It, it did sound as though I think Klopp said a couple of weeks back that, it, or was it last week that it was a re- reoccurrence of the injury that he got for Egypt. Um, he originally said it was fatigue in the muscle, didn't he? So yeah, it's, it's, it's more serious than that. Yeah, I mean, m- m- must be shattered, must not have still still got fatigue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's not going to play tomorrow, is he? But he is at least on the comeback trail, which is um, huge news for Liverpool. And like I said, I don't think he'll... he'll tra- I mean, he might travel to Prague, I'm not sure, but um, if, if it was me, I'd be uh, pinpointing that Man City game and getting him fit and ready for that one. I don't want to write him off. and I'm not writing him off. But it does remind you that Salah is human. He is the wrong side of 30 now, and this is a player who's rarely been injured for Liverpool throughout his entire career when he has been it's only been one or two games and he had the shoulder injury in the Champions League final that, that's about it isn't it for serious injuries before this one and then was it a concussion that kept him out of Barcelona so for him to oh, I'll get a hamstring injury but I'll be back in a couple of weeks no it's going to be three to four weeks then he makes his comeback and now he's out for another two three weeks after it I'm not saying age is catching up on him, but they are going to have to tread carefully a bit more with him now going forwards. He's not going to be the, the superhuman uh, Luis Suarez where you just give him an injection, bandage him up, and he just plays through everything. They, they have to be a bit more smarter about him now. One thing I would say is Liverpool just have had no luck after with injuries in terms of a player getting injured and then you th- it being like, oh, it's actually not as serious as we thought. You know, he's back earlier than we, than we imagined. They're out and then they try and play it down and play it down and make you think that maybe the next game they're going to be back and then they're not and they're not. And before you know it, they've missed six, seven, eight, eight games and they're still on the shelf. 
a little bit similar with Salah, you know, muscle fatigue, touching go for the Luton game. You know, that was four games ago now and Salah's still not going to be available. So, um, yeah, they, they could do with some good luck, really. You know, the player gets a knock and he's OK. That doesn't tend to happen a lot at Liverpool. The only one that's surprised is what, Alisson, when he was back after two weeks the first time and then that's been completely undone by mm. suffering the same injury and now being out for an extended period. I suppose Endo's a bit of a surprise, I must say, for him to only be out for a week when you see him in the protective boot and stuff. That, that's a, he's got to you know, come back first. He's, he's, yeah, he's still got to be come back. This could be, oh, we, he might train today and then we don't see him and then we don't see him in open training next week. It's a good thing we're doing this live because yeah. the last time I was hosting it was it was pre-recorded and then the next thing you know, Alisson's out. Uh, but yeah, um, we're not sure if we'll get training pitches today so we'll clear things up a little bit then on Endo and a few of these. At least with Robertson, you know, I suggest an illness. He'll, he should be okay. That's what we can write off as back for Liverpool in some form. Yeah, he's got the bubonic plague or something. <laughs> I think with, with how good Liverpool have been and the, the wins that keep coming, you sort of do move over the fact that the, the first choice goalkeeper has been missing. So it's worth a mention for Keller because I think, as Gorsty said before, he has an, Southampton has an absolute storm of chances. You're just shouting out the Irish audience again. Yeah, hello to all our Irish followers. <laughs> um, but no, he's, he's, he's doing a, a good job and it's only maybe six, seven months ago, maybe in, in the January transfer window, we got people saying he needs to move out to find game time. He's came in and then he's not not had an absolute blemish on his performances he's kept Liverpool in the final and in the, the fifth round of the FA Cup well, it's funny timing to bring this up isn't it because it was Forrest had the bid rejected for him on deadline yeah. day so I'm sure that it's almost be, as if I knew that it might be one of the pieces that someone writes don't worry <laughs> but yeah it's he, he has been great these last few weeks I think Klopp referenced was it the Fulham game where he's not at fault for the goals but you think could you do better with the Harry Wilson one could you do better with another one and people think oh, he's not Alisson is he but he's a player who needs rhythm. Goalkeepers need rhythm, and he's getting it now. And you're seeing, oh, that reminds us why Liverpool rated him so highly in the first place two, three years ago. Some outstanding saves. Usually, you know, Alisson, when he's one-on-one, -on -one, any other goalkeeper lets this in, and he somehow just blocks it with his body or gets a foot to it. And you're starting to have that confidence in Kelleher now. Like some of the saves against Chelsea were incredible. He's done the same against Southampton, against Luton. Uh, he's not in Alisson's bracket just yet but you, you opening your eyes to how good he really is. And it's a bit of a, a dilemma with what happens with him here. In terms of end of the season, you don't know when Alisson returns. But if Alisson returns in, say, May, you just keep faith with Keller until the end of the season and then leave it in the hands of the new manager to decide who he wants to be his first choice? Or is this uh, his farewell tour as well? Going out on a high, adding a, a zero or a couple of digits to that uh, transfer fee and going out big in Dublin. We'll, we'll see. But yeah, he's can hold his head up high. He's had a great run of form at the moment and long may it continue. And let's just move on to tomorrow, Forrest. You're maybe going to the, the trip down to the city grounds. Is it city grounds? Yeah, yeah. all three of us are. Oh, so we got a, a full squad. So... Unlike Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. Never know. Take your boots. Um, but obviously, Forrest's uh, record in recent weeks hasn't been, it's been up and down with two wins and three Not going to hit me with some, some, uh, some, some Forrest knowledge, are you? Some pure stats. Um, obviously, Liverpool last lost the two, each of the last two three o'clock kickoffs in uh, Brighton, both 3 nils and Wolves, Brighton and Wolves. Do you want to try that again? I was in two of the last three o'clock games, they've lost them both 3 nil. And obviously Forrester. Have they? Yeah, apparently so. So, they, so I remember the Brighton game. That was well over a year ago. Wolves as well. Three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday. That was like that. So was, wait, that was it's three o'clock away kickoffs. Maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say we've had a couple of at home and we haven't lost at Anfield yeah. for over a year. Well, there we go. <laughs> so away, away games tricky. Liverpool found it hard last season, but I suppose it's a microcosm of a pretty dour season, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I did that. The kind of a uh, Liverpool insight and you know with a Nottingham Forest podcast yesterday and they were asking about that game and, and could that be you know a positive for Forest that to, to, you know Liverpool were, were beaten there last season and I just think Liverpool are a totally different animal to what they were at that, that time I think it was around about October time of, of last season so it's a um, it's a long hold space of time in between those two games best part of 18 months um, they sort of rushed back from injury for that one as well yeah, Thiago got injured. Oh, Thiago got an ear infection on the morning of the game and, and missed New it. Guys and, missed it as well, didn't they? Yeah, and, I think like Jones or Elliot. Jones had to play, and it, you know it was one of those times. And it wasn't Jones that, that he is now, if, if you see what I mean. And Van Dijk missed a couple of of guilt edge chances, and, and Forrest ultimately deserved to win that day. But um, I think Liverpool are, are rolling on in in much better form. Um, the injuries is the one. I know we talk about it a lot, but you can't get away from the fact that. 
you know, Liverpool had 13 first team players missing on, on Wednesday night through injuries. You know, it's different if it's five or six, even that. Like that 14 if you want to include a illness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's different to to four or five or six, isn't it? You know, that's a fair old chunk of, of your squad. So um, I think that could be a route into the game for Forrest, but uh, I just think the way Liverpool are, are going at the moment, there seems to be a real momentum, a real steel and determination, you know, kind of within the, the mentality of the team to um, not let injuries become an excuse or an explanation or mitigation. They kind of just dig deep, dig as deep as they can. And, and like we say, with Nunes potentially coming back and to Bosley and um, maybe Endo, you'd think or you'd hope that maybe they will have too much for Forrest. I think it's almost a case of who wants it more. As there's the old cliche with Liverpool fighting at the top and with a recent club's point deduction reduction, they've now down to 17th. And I think what we've seen last year with the City ground, they can't play a part and they are going to, they need to get points. And with a new manager, they've almost shown the have can get them results as well. Well, they've got some good players, haven't they? Like Gibbs White, Alanga, Hudson Adoy, mm. uh, he. Like, good some attacking players there. Nico Williams in defence as well. I'm not sure if he starts every week these days. Murillo's good as well, I think. At the yeah. Back. yeah. So that's some good quality at both ends of the pitch. They signed a new goalkeeper in January. but They've had a ton of time with the goalkeeper situation. They've played about five since the start of last season. Was it? Uh, it's not the first choice now. It was the last one, wasn't it? It was at fault for the, the goals at Anfield. You know, yeah. he came rushing out his line. Uh, they've, they've, yeah, they've had Kayla Nawas, Dean Henderson, um, Vlad, Vladika Moss, or whatever his name yeah. was. Uh, Matt Turner. Matt Turner. Um, is he the one on the ITV doc at the moment? The, 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 yeah, the wag one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he's making headlines for mm-hmm. other reasons. But yeah, like you said, they've had dodgy reasons with the, the goalkeepers, but I think Sells is the one they've got from mm. Strasbourg, and he seems to have been a solid pair of hands for him. But they've got some good players there, and you, you know the strengths. They're going to be good at set pieces, as they were last year, but they've got pace as well, and they can hurt teams on the counter-attack. I remember when they won at Stamford Bridge earlier in the season, that they pounced on was it a Caicedo mistake in midfield, and just hit them on the counter, scored, got a Easy, easy win for against a poor Chelsea side at the time, but like Liverpool, they're a bit more savvy about that these days. Like, yeah, last year it was the sort of game you can see why they lost. They hated playing away from home. They were getting done on the counter. They were getting done in these physical battles. They were shorter bodies, but now they're a bit more safe and familiar in, in their formation. They know where each player is going to be, even when it's a, a much changed side. I forgot what the question was. I'm just going to keep going on about Forest here. But yeah, it, it's worked out all right for them. The few players coming back from injury, you'd like to think they've got enough about them. Yeah, I think McAllister will be will be big tomorrow. You know, you mentioned it about the counter attacks and whatever. He's just really settled into that role now. As he really closes the gap, sees the danger early, doesn't need to fly into tackles. He just knows where he is, keeps it short and simple, and keeps Liverpool ticking over. And I think if he plays in that number six, if Endo can't make it, I think Liverpool should be okay really. But then it's about who's who you get around them, you know, because I don't think Bobby Clark's going to be playing or, or McConnell. Elliot, maybe. I and mean, we'll come on to team selection, I guess. But um, yeah, McAllister for me going to be huge. I reckon there'll be a full debut. I reckon one of them will get the nod. It's just uh, not many on else left. Nelson's done a better job than I have with the stat. He said, don't get too excited yet because even though we are better than Nottingham Forest, we haven't beat them in their last 13 Premier League visits since 1984, 1985. I don't think Nuno Espirito Santo has beaten Liverpool ever. Another one for them. Yeah, I mean, not like they played them every year, though, is it? They, they went in the Premier League for 25 years. Yeah. Well, close enough. They were not batter of in 98, I'm assuming that's going to be at Anfield because they definitely won them like 5-1 in that season because Michael Owen scored four. So it was in Anfield. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a tricky ground to go to, and like like I said, they're, they're a team. Oh yeah, and d- the bottom, they they will have their their fans right up for it. You know, we've we've been there the last two seasons, haven't we? Did the FA Cup was it a quarter final that one with J- Jota's yeah. winner, um, and the fans were well up for it then, as you'd understand with it being a cup tie, and they were in the championship. But last season for them was was kind of like, you know, these are the days that we dreamt about of being back in the Premier League. You know, teams like Liverpool and. You know, the likes of Manchester United going there and they can try and re- lay one on them and, and they did to be to be fair last season. So yeah, they'll be well up for this one. And Liverpool have, have got to handle that with the injury crisis as well. So um it's gonna be gonna be tough. But I thought Klopp was interesting today when he said normally we we have fo- we focus on ourselves and then we look at the opposition, but this this week has been very much more about ourselves because it's almost like, well, who's gonna play? What can we do? How are the legs, how are the limbs? And seeing what kind of team we can get on the pitch. And we'll move on to the, the lineups now. Obviously, there's only one or two to choose from. Is yeah. it easy as? <laughs> Kelleher, obviously. Um, 
yeah, Connor Bradley, Robertson comes back in. Um, can I say in Van Dyke? Well, you um, to, can you see any room for Gomez? Yes, but it depends who's available here from the rest of the team. Like Robertson, yeah, he, ha- he hasn't trained yet. Well, he, well, you know, just gone four o'clock, so he's probably trained now if he's making his comeback today. And Callister was out for like one and a half days. Klopp says so. You like to think he's over his illness and he can play. If he's not, you put Simicast there, Canate, Van Dijk, and Bradley. But you wouldn't have any issues with Gomez there. But if we get into the midfield, maybe you just put Gomez as holding mid again. The chances now, would you put him in yeah, midfield? Team. Yeah, Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to put Gomez out in midfield again uh, with McAllister to one side and Bobby Clark can get a full debut on the other. I, I know Sabosla is going to be back, but it's he, he did his hamstring, didn't he? And then he did it again. Like You don't want to rush him. You don't want to start him and risk him breaking yeah. down again. Yeah. You have to tread carefully with that injury. Uh, Elliot, he's an option, but you, you're probably needing him in the front three. And out of those youngsters, if you're going to start one, I think Clark's at the head of that that peck in order there. Like he's looks so good when he has made these appearances, and he's like Bradley, where he would have played more this season if he didn't have an un, uh, untimely injury uh, in the first half of the campaign. But yeah, it's down to the bare bones, isn't it? Like Endo is another one. You don't want to risk him if he's not trained yet. Yeah. If it's one training session, he's just on the bench. Yeah, that, I'm I'm going to risk Endo actually because I think Gibbs White will be huge for them in those little pockets, and Endo will be required to to close off those spaces. This for me. A little bit similar to Brentford a few weeks back. Liverpool handled that massively well and they you know, really come through a, a tricky one superbly. Obviously got the injuries, though so there's left them kind of in this mess that they're in. But I'm going to go with Endo, McAllister, and I'm going to bring back Elliot. And like you say, I'm going to bring in Zabozlai onto the bench, but uh, he can kick his heels for, you know, 70, 80 minutes. And do you start Nunes because with their, their centre half? Going to have to, yeah. But I, I think he might go on the left, and I think Gakpo will lead the line and, and throw Diaz on on the right. And it's a little bit of a, a um, untried front three, but um, needs must at the moment. You're just ruthless here, aren't you? I don't care that you've been out for a couple of weeks. Get in that team, go and do this. Sure, have to, hasn't he? <laughs> Uh, out of the, all the injured ones coming back, I think Nunes is the one you can more likely take a risk with. Like They weren't really clear what the actual issue he suffered at mm. Brentford was. So I, I could be talking rubbish here. He, he could have done a muscle injury and tweaked it. And you the don't way he left it. over the, the hall. Yeah, the after that, you think he, he should be okay. With Colin Jackson, the, really? But I, I think I've left him out the side here just because I've still got three players left who can go in the front three. So we Elliot, Gakpo and Diaz. But if you've got the extra body there, he's the one who can start and you reshuffle everyone else. So Boss lies on my bench, Endo's on my bench. Uh, Rob's, yeah, I'm going to say he's over at illness so he can start, but that's it, isn't it, for who's actually available. And predictions, of any scores? Is there going to be a free score on match or is it going to be another day where Van Dijk hits the bar at the post and misses a sitter? Oh, surely Liverpool got, got to win this year. Hmm. Like They're in such good form at the moment. They're so resilient. And if you can beat Chelsea in a League Cup final with half a team of academy youngsters with a few of the first team back, surely you win at Forest. Let's go 2-0. A clean sheet. Is it? They've got a couple in the last couple yeah, of games. couldn't go and buy one, and now he's got two and two. Yeah. Is it? Is one, one nil Liverpool. One tight. Nil. Tight nil. I think pessimistic two one Liverpool again. I think um, it's going to be tight. And I've, look, luckily it's not twelve o'clock, and you know how much I don't like twelve thirty kickoffs when they are nip and tuck. But that's enough for this uh, this week's Blood Red podcast. Thank you for tuning in live on YouTube and Facebook. If you are new round here, subscribe. Click. The, the like button and ding dong that notification bell <laughs> make sure you like all of our social medias with x facebook and instagram and we will see threads you. threads yeah threads as well, well maybe ours I'm not sure if uh, we don't have a brand threads account yet do we i don't think oh, no. <laughs> Just it, was, it, was, it was a thing for a bit wasn't it threads for about two days <laughs> and if you're on apple apple podcasts or spotify make sure you're following um and if you're joe Hope you're well. Uh, <laughs> thanks for tuning in to this week's Broadback Podcast. Um, we'll catch you next week. Thank you very much for listening.